Welcome, everyone. We're glad that you can join us at whatever time that you are joining us. Um, and we just uh, hope that you're encouraged by these songs and that you join us in whatever way that you are comfortable doing so. And we're just going to sing some great songs that remind us about our dear Lord and Savior.
song there Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mountain fixed upon it Bounds of thy redeeming love I was lost in utter darkness Till you came and rescued me I was bound by all my sin When your love came and set me free Now my soul and sing a new song Now my heart has found a home And your grace is always with me And I'm there goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee prone to wander lord i feel it prone to leave the god i love here's my heart lord seek and seal it seal it for thy cause above So it's summertime, and I've spent quite a bit of time outdoors lately, and there's lots of wonderful things to look at here in Muskoka. We've got the trees, the water, the rocks, uh, the animals, um, and I've been paying a little bit of attention to rocks and to stones, and it's amazing some of the things that you see, how it seems like there's stones that are sort of holding back the 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 bank of, a, of some water and land and keeping them separated. And it's amazing to see how trees seem to just grow over top of them. Uh, and stones can be chopped, chipped, or they can be crushed, or they can be shaped. Uh, but the one thing is they can't do anything on their own. They don't have any sort of life to them. Um, can't walk up and go somewhere else. Although I wish some of them might relocate themselves on our property to different places I would like them to be, but that doesn't seem to happen. Um, 1 Peter 2 speaks of Jesus as the living cornerstone on which the church is built, and to us as living stones uh, where he's forming his temple. So 1 Peter 2, verse 4 to 6, as you come to him, a living stone, Rejected by people, but chosen and honored by God. You yourselves, as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood, a holy, holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and honored cornerstone. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. So God has actually brought us to life who were previously dead in our sins, like the stones that can't do anything on their own. 
and he's forming us into this spiritual house or dwelling. In 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. So having experienced God's amazing grace, there is definitely a call to action for us. I encourage you to read all of 1 Peter chapter 2 yourself, um, and you'll find actually some interesting similarities to some of the passages that Peter and Jeremy have been speaking to us about this spring from Romans. Um, But the spoiler alert is it's kind of uh, in verse 2 and 3 of that chapter where really he talks about... um, So that those who have tasted that the Lord is good, that we should grow up into our salvation and then provides more details as it goes. The next song gives us a chance to reflect on this wonderful, wonderful, amazing gift we have been given and what our response should be.
pray for a sec here. Lord, we thank you so much for keeping us safe in this incredibly awesome country we're in and how we're actually uh, being taken care of. And uh, we just uh, see your hand in all this. And what, what we ask now is that, uh, again, our hearts are stubborn, so we need you to uh, open our hearts and our minds are dull and we need you to quicken our minds and uh, help us to perceive the word that is going to be spoken here today. And we just ask this because of what your Holy Son Jesus has done for us. Uh, we ask this in your precious name. Amen. There are a lot of passages in the Bible that talk about sheep and shepherds. And probably the most famous is Psalm 23 that starts, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, or I have everything I need. It's a, it's a passage that's often read at funerals, but it's not actually about what happens in death. It's about living your life with God as your shepherd. That, that God would provide for you and lead you and guide you and protect you from danger. And that even if you walk through the darkest valley, valley he'd be there with you. And so it's a, it's a psalm that paints a picture of the ideal human life, the way we were meant to live as sheep under God's shepherdship. Now, the problem is that a lot of the other verses about sheep and shepherd in the Bible are about how God's sheep are constantly wandering away from him, about how we don't follow him and we don't live under his care. And maybe one of the most famous of these is in Isaiah 53, where it says that we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way. See, the problem with sheep is that they don't always follow the shepherd. Now, in Luke 15, Jesus tells a story that helps us to see God's heart for sheep or people who turn away from him, who get lost, who end up finding themselves alone and in danger and without his hand to protect them. And, and Jesus tells the story. See, Jesus had been hanging out with some of the wrong people, which he often did, the, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, and all kinds of other people that the, the religious people of his day labeled as sinners. And they came and they said, this guy can't be a real righteous man because he's hanging around with all these riffraff. And, and uh, 
putting his blessing on their life by associating with them. And so they dismissed him or they criticized him. And Jesus, instead of answering them directly, told a story. And we find this story in Luke 15. Here's what he said. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Of course, Jesus wasn't talking about sheep here. He was talking about human beings and how when we run away, when we go our own path, when we choose to do our own thing, which we often do, um, God doesn't just leave us. He doesn't just shrug his shoulders and say, well, I hope they come back eventually. He doesn't just give up on us and leave us to our own devices and give us up for dead. But he comes after us. He cares enough for his sheep that he chases us down. He launches this rescue mission. Every time we wander away, he comes after us. Now, this isn't just about us as individuals when we sin or when we fall or when we go our own way. It's actually a picture of what has happened in the whole human race. It's the larger story that the Bible has been telling ever since Adam and Eve first turned away from God, ever since they decided they wanted to be their own shepherds, their own bosses, their own guides. Ever since then, God has embarked on this divine cosmic rescue mission to come after the lost sheep of the entire human race. And that's the story that we have recorded in the Bible. In fact, it's the reason that Jesus came. And see, in the, the most incredible story of all was that Jesus was actually God come down to earth as a human being. It's almost like the shepherd became a sheep in order to come and rescue them, in order to live among them, to experience what they were experiencing, and to earn their trust in that way. And what's really interesting, and the biggest plot twist of all, was that the shepherd became a sheep not just to show us the right way to live, but the shepherd became a sheep to offer himself as a sacrificial lamb. You see, Jesus came and he he lived among us anonymously for many years as a, as a carpenter in a backwater town, in a family that had no real reputation. And it wasn't until the last years of his life that he began to let us in on who he was. He began to do these things that human beings had never done, like give sight to the blind, raise the dead back to life. He did stuff like walk on water, or calm the seas with a word. And All of these things pointed to the fact that he was someone very different than anyone who ever lived. And people, when they came to hear what he taught and how how he described God, said, this guy teaches not like the other rabbis, but he has an authority that we can't understand. But there was a lot of controversy. People didn't know what to think, whether to trust him or whether to be skeptical because they had been duped in the past. And so Jesus stands up in front of all of them, in front of the religious leaders that thought he was a fraud, in front of the people who who were following him and listening to his teachings. And he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd, the one that could be trusted. He said that the others who've come before me weren't the real shepherd. They were either hired hands who ran away when there was trouble or danger, or they were thieves and robbers who came to kill and steal and destroy. He said, but I'm, I'm the good shepherd and I'm here to offer life to the full. And then he said something surprising. He says, I'm the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now that was not a normal thing to say. See, shepherds cared for their sheep, especially if they owned them, and they would be willing to face danger and face predators in order to protect them. But no shepherd would willingly and knowingly go to his own death just to save a couple sheep. It just didn't make sense. It wasn't logical. And so the idea that a shepherd would willingly, knowingly lay down his life for the sheep, that was unheard of. 
But that's what Jesus said he was going to do. And, and not too long after that, he faced his own death and he allowed himself to be tortured and beaten and mocked. And he allowed the soldiers to drive nails into his hands and then to hoist him up on a cross where he was left to die. And he made sure that we knew that it wasn't some great tragedy, that it wasn't somehow the ultimate triumph of evil over good. He made sure to, to point out that he laid his life down willingly of his own accord. Nobody took it from him, but he laid it down for our sakes. He said, I, I could call thousands of angels to come and rescue me. See, Jesus' death wasn't this tragic mistake. It wasn't his ultimate defeat. It was actually his ultimate victory. And the reason that he came, the good shepherd, came in order to lay down his life for the sheep. Now, what does that mean? Why did he do that? Well, we had all wandered astray. We had all gone away from our shepherd. And this not only made us, uh, put us in a situation where we were lost and alone and in trouble, but it actually, on another level, caused us to stand guilty, judged under God's punishment for wandering away, for trying to be our own God. And Isaiah 53, the passage I mentioned earlier that said that, uh, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned our own away. Way. It ends with this phrase, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. In other words, there is this mysterious figure that Isaiah was talking about that somehow God would place all of our sins, all of our wandering, all of our guilt, all of our shame onto this person. And this person would suffer and be wounded for us. And that's what we learn happened through Jesus. That as just in the same way that in the Old Testament, people would offer animals as sacrifices to make atonement with God, to make things right with God and take away their sins, that Jesus was offering himself as the ultimate sacrificial lamb to take away my sins and to take away yours so that we could be reconnected with God, so that nothing would stand in the way of us having that relationship, that sheep-shepherd relationship with God that we were designed for. Now, how do we relearn what it means to live in this relationship? Jesus has opened the gate. He's paved the way. Well, this is how he describes it when he's talking to his disciples. When he says he's the good shepherd, he describes the kind of relationship that he wants with his sheep. In John 10, he says this, His sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. The goal of the Christian life is not memorizing a set of rules, somehow doing everything in here on our own. We're not just sort of rescued by Jesus and then left to figure out how to live in this sheep-shepherd relationship. Jesus is still calling us by name. He's still calling his sheep to himself. And this isn't something that just happens once when, when we start to follow him. It's, it's an everyday reality that we learn to recognize his voice and respond to his voice. See, there's this misconception about sheep that they're just gullible, that they'll follow anything. Sometimes it's used as a derogatory term of people who are gullible and just um, believe anything they hear, follow anyone who, who wants them to follow, and they call them sheep. But the truth is that sheep are very wary and very suspicious of any stranger that comes among them. Sheep do not just follow anyone. Sheep run away from anyone they perceive to be a threat or who's a stranger. Sheep have this uncanny ability, though, to recognize human voices and faces. And the human being that is their shepherd, the one that cares for them and leads them and takes care of them from the time they're born, they're able to develop trust 
in him. They're able to learn what it means to, to hear his voice and see his face, and they become responsive to that voice. And then no matter where they are, when he calls, they come running because they know they can trust him. And this is the kind of relationship that Jesus invites us into, one where we recognize his voice and we learn to trust him and we learn that he is for us, that he's there for our good, that we can trust him to provide for us, that we learn that he has a kind and gentle heart and he'll provide rest for our souls. And so the key to the Christian life is learning to recognize the voice of the good shepherd who calls us by name. Now that's not something we learn overnight. It's something that happens over the course of a lifetime. It's something that happens one day at a time. And if we didn't listen to his voice yesterday, we have another chance to listen to his voice today. Here's the other part of what it means to learn to live again in this sheep-shepherd relationship. We have to learn to recognize the voices of strangers and to run away. See, there's all kinds of other voices speaking into our lives all the time. It's not just the voice of Jesus, but it's the voice of the world around us, the culture that that isn't interested in following God, that, that wants to go its own way and wants us to follow along. The voices of our own selfish desires that don't really have our good in mind, but we always fall for their tricks. It's the voices of peer pressure, the voices of the media, TV, movies, all trying to get us to follow in what ends up being a dangerous way that that leaves us lost and alone. And so part of the Christian life is learning to recognize the voice of our shepherd, and part of it is learning to recognize the other voices that are seeking to steal and kill and destroy. Now, how do we do this? Like I say, it's a lifetime of learning. We learn by following. We learn by reading the Bible and learning to hear God's voice in the Bible. And especially we learn in the context of community. See, sheep don't learn to trust a shepherd just on their own. They learn in the context of a flock as they see the other sheep trusting the shepherd. They grow up in a flock where they learn what it looks like to trust the the shepherd to do them good. And it's the same way that when Jesus calls us into following him as our shepherd, that he doesn't call us alone. He calls us in the context of a flock where we are together with other sheep and we're learning together what it means to follow him. See, when we're alone, we're vulnerable. We're vulnerable to being misled and going our own way. But in community, we can help each other. We can support each other. We can help each other know when it's the shepherd's voice and when we think that's probably not the voice of Jesus. We can help each other know the character of the shepherd so that we can recognize his voice in our lives and sort out the lies from the truth. So our assignment this week is simply to find some time to be alone and to listen for the voices in our head. Take a journal, take a piece of paper, and just sit and quiet yourself and reflect on all the voices that are coming at you on a regular basis and what their messages are. What is it that the media is telling you? What is it that movies and TVs are telling you? What are the people around you in our society telling you? How are they seeking to lead you into your own path, into a path that's going to leave you lost and alone? And then what's that still small voice of the good shepherd saying? Can you hear him calling you by name intimately, tenderly? What is his encouraging, careful, gentle voice calling you to do? You see, when we can learn to recognize and respond to the voice of the good shepherd, we can learn to live the kind of life that David described in Psalm 23. The life where we have everything we need, we shall not want. Where he leads us into green pastures, where he leads us beside quiet waters, refreshes our soul. He guides us along the right paths. Where even when things get dark and lonely and scary, even when we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, we're not afraid because he's with us. That's what it means to live 
with God as our good shepherd. And David finishes out that psalm with this incredible promise. He says, surely goodness and mercy or goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, will chase after me, even when I get lost, even when I go astray, goodness and love comes chasing after me. And he ends it like this, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You and I were meant to live not as our own independent sheep, but as part of God's flock under his care, being provided for by him, being led by him, being protected by him. That's the best life we could possibly live. It's the fullest life we could possibly live. And it's the reason that Jesus came as our good shepherd. Here, sheepies, come here. Where are you going? Thank you.